So now the word to Frank, and he'll be talking about GDPR in France. Those who want to hear technical stuff, please go to bedrooms because I probably have the only non-technical talk of the entire two days. It's still early. Yeah, it's still early. <laughs> and I'll bore you with about 2,000 slides about GDPR and Murray and stuff. So. Can we just give you one? Yeah, <laughs> certainly. So, who am I? Um, I'm Frank. Frank B on Twitter. Uh, I have a history in a service provider world. I uh, built, grew, and sold a managed hosting company um, doing freelance gigs uh, the last year. And I'm involved in a startup called GDPR Butler, which tries to simplify GDPR requirements for small enterprises. So I uh, happen to be a nerd who knows a bit about GDPR. As in all good GDPR presentations, it will be full of acronyms. Um, Two of the f most important ones are these two. The first one stands for, this is not a sales pitch. <laughs> While I am involved in a startup about GDPR, I'm not going to talk about our product. Um, it will be mentioned on, I think, two or three slides, one of the slides you've already seen. Um, but the second one is, is even more important. I am not a lawyer. Um, so I've so studied the GDPR, <laughs> I've read it. I um, think I understand how it works but I could be completely wrong. Um, if you do something that's on my slide and I tell you that's okay, and it's not okay, I'm sorry, I'm not alone. Right? So, um, now we have that out of the way. The talk is called GDPR for nerds, which means I'll talk about GDPR stuff and a tiny bit of, about how it affects you uh, as a nerd. Unfortunately, we have to start with the boring stuff, the GDPR. Um, I assume that unless, unless you've been living in a under a rock in Australia, you have some vague idea about the GDPR. Um, let's, let's rehearse uh, and, and review the absolute basic of the basis of the GDPR. GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. Now, general is important um, because it applies to more than you might think. If you're a, a controller, which is an organization that controls personal data, uh, and you're a controller in Europe, it applies to all personal data you process, whether they are from European citizens, European residents, or even people from the outside of the continent. Now, if you are a controller or processor that is outside of Europe, it still applies. It applies to not EU citizens, as most people think, not even EU residents, but people that are in the EU could be temporary. No matter what their nationality is, no, mat no matter what their formal status in the company is, um, it still applies, which leads to some interesting uh, situations. We'll cover one of them later. Um, the D stands for data. What is personal data? Well, the GDPR kindly gives us a definition, quite long. I've quoted it on the slides. Um, I've highlighted a few words. Uh, which are important. One of them is that it applies to, uh, can be identified directly or indirectly. So GDPR, personal data, is not just about some of these names, about some of these birth data. It can also be some other data that could identify a person, which is a uh, large uh, major difference with how they look at privacy in, in the United States, for instance. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave the boring uh, stuff there. GDPR is about protecting. Um, GDPR has defined that if you process and, and you must process data, um, the, the processing must be done lawfully, fairly, transparently. You must limit its purpose, which means you can only, if you process data, you have to know why you process it and only use that data for that specific purpose. Uh, you have to minimize the data. If you don't need a certain amount of personal data, why do you keep it? GDPR tells you, no, don't keep it. Only keep and process what you absolutely need to, to work with. Has to be accurate and up to date. Um, you can't store it anywhere you want to. Um, you have to process it confidentially and securely. And you're accountable and liable 
for processing it. So uh, keeping some documentation about how, why uh, you process the data. Last part, it's a regulation, uh, which means it's an EU law that does not need to be translated into national law. It applies for the entire European space uh, starting May 25th. So now I will start with funny acronyms. The first one is, this was the boring stuff. Uh, second one is, time for a little quiz. Does the GDPR apply to a US bank targeting US expats living in Europe? Probably. It does. Most people think it doesn't. It actually does. As they are in public. They are at that point in Europe and they are clearly targeted um, by that bank which has a special credit card offer some kind uh, for people living there. So yes, it applies. This one I think was made famous in the news a couple of days ago. The GDPR applied to Facebook Ireland regarding Japanese customers. Japanese users of Facebook. Yes yep. it does. Because technically Facebook Ireland is the pro was their processor until two days ago. Um, so the GDPR would apply to all Japanese, African, Asian, um, Facebook users. Now what did Facebook do because they didn't like that? They technically or administratively moved all those users to Facebook states. So Facebook Ireland currently only processes users of Facebook in Europe, uh, which are covered by GDPR. So they, uh, they avoided the GDPR regulation for about 1.5 billion not on misconstruction. Data means PNI. PNI is a term that apply. Uh, sorry, that needs to be PII. Um, no. If you look at your uh, U.S. definitions of, of personally identifiable information, it usually involves either somebody's name, somebody's credit card, social security number. GDPR goes way beyond that. Um, Slightly grey-haired gentleman with glasses and the speakers in wearing a shirt that resembles a Slack logo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, sorry Toshan. Um, just that description identifies Toshan. People who are at the speaker's dinner or recognize him know that this is Toshan. I don't need to put his name there. Uh, everybody knows it's Toshan. Toshan. So this is personal information. And this applies to GDPR while it would not apply to U.S. privacy regulations. So that's the major difference you have to keep into account. He's never going to wear that shirt anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, another one. You must have consent if you want to process data. No. No. Yes? No? <coughs> no? All right. You're all very clever. Indeed, consent is one of the six legal bases you uh, can use to process data. And even consent is fairly specified in GDPR. It has to be freely given, specific, informed, unambiguous, and by an affirmative action. Now, those definitions might seem logic to you, but especially the first one, freely given, isn't all that clear. Because if you imagine you're applying for a job, and um, during the interview process, they want to do a background check on you. Now, in Belgium, those things don't turn up anything because of other legal laws, but in other countries, uh, it's a common uh, procedure. And they ask you to sign a release form giving consent to do that background check. Check. Now, that consent isn't freely given, because you know that if you don't sign the form, you probably won't get the job. So. If a company is doing that, then they can't use the I have consent case to process that data. It's important to keep in mind. Now, luckily for the company, there are other five more reasons why you could process data according to GDPR. We've covered consent. The second one is obvious, contract. If I have a contract with you to um, ship you a certain item, I need your address. Otherwise, I can't ship you the thing. I need the address to perform the contract. So I need to ask, I don't need to ask your consent to use your address because otherwise I can't um, execute like the contract. The consent is implied because I asked you to yeah. send it. So uh, yeah, yeah. So I, de I don't need to ask your consent. Again, it's implied by the contract. It will also be implied by a legal obligation. If the law 
um, tells me you have to keep that data for 10 years for tax reasons, then I have to keep that data for tax, re for tax reasons for 10 years. I don't need to ask your consent. The law has provided me the consent I need. Um, two special ones you'll, you'll almost never see, vital interests. Um, forget that one unless you're working in a hospital. Um, this involves saving somebody's life. Um, you can't ask consent to process their medical data if they're nearly dying and they're on the operating theater. And sure, the operating you can. So, uh, well, they try to in states, but they don't need to. In, in, it's in cheaper. No <laughs> <laughs> uh, one public task, um, unless you're working for a government that has to do a certain public task by law, then forget that reason as well. It only applies to them. Um, the last one is interesting, legitimate interest. The GDPR defined that if a company has a legitimate interest to process that data and they're doing it in such a way that the privacy risk on the individual are not that big, then they don't need explicit consent. Uh, one example could be um, network scanning in a company. A company wants to uh, avoid having viruses in their, co in their corporate network and as such are implementing an advanced antivirus product that scans network, tra network traffic. If that scanning is done in an automated way and there's no human that looks at all the packets processing and looks at all the sites you're visiting, but it's a computer that's doing that, then that probably is in the legitimate interest of the company and they don't need an explicit consent. You could even argue that that consent could again not be freely given. Not be freely given. If your employer wants you to sign a consent form for scanning uh, the network or even the contents of your laptop, it's probably not really freely given if you sign it because you know that if you don't sign the document you might get fired or have issues or have an uncertain future at that company. Um, Luckily for that company, if they do it wisely, they could claim legitimate interests. I have an absolute right to be forgotten on the GDPR, yes or no? No. 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 Excellent. That's really clever on you. The right to be forgotten should be honored unless you can't. Um, if there's a, another reason that has priority, then and somebody asks you to remove their data, if you would ask me to remove your address, um, and I still have to ship that document, I can't. So I won't. Uh, but later on you could. Later on I could, and I should. Yeah. And that's more potential from that. Sorry? They have to keep the tax record for 10 years. And yeah, yeah, the of course. Yeah. 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 That, that overrules the other. So you can't yeah. be forgotten at that point. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, once the 10 years are over, it's not going to Yeah, then you should delete. <laughs> immediately delete it. Well, immediately. You should have policy defining when you delete it, and you should delete it. And if you, I mean, 10 years is such a long period that if you keep it for more than 10 years, you should have a really valid reason why you keep it for more than 10 years. Now, the right to be forgotten is one of the rights. There are other rights that individuals have as well. Um, right of access to data, which means you can ask a company that has data for you, please <coughs> give me a copy of all the data you have could ask me, please give me a copy of all the data you have. And I have, I think, 30 or 40 days to comply to you. And I have to send it to you. Uh, funny thing is, if you ask Facebook, you get a, a zip file that's huge. So yes. it's really scary. Uh, you have the right to do so. You uh, just tested it. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, also have the right to rectification. If I have an old address of you and I'm still using that old address and you know that, that you can ask me, hey, please fix my address and I have to comply, I have to change your address. Um, the right to restrict processing, if we have a dispute, uh, you can ask me, please freeze my data as it is today. Well, because we have this dispute and I don't want that data touched, so please freeze it or stop doing something because the reason you're claiming is invalid, etc., etc. And, and please freeze it at this moment until we figure out who's right and who's wrong, and we'll see at that point. The right to object to processing, uh, and the right to data portability. Now, the last one um, is also often misunderstood. The EU does not define the standards that, that, or the format that the data portability needs to be in. There just needs to be some way of 
getting all your data back once you're finished. Um, imagine you're, you're switching banks and you have all your um, preferred, um, how do you call it, your, your little address book in your banking application of all the accounts you, per you use a lot. Um, there has to be a way to get that out. If you use a uh, smart uh, energy meter, there has to be some way to get all that data back once you decide to change providers. But what's the difference to the first wife then? Access to data? Uh, that the second one, it's, it needs to be in some computer readable form. Okay. It's not defined how that form should be, but it's a form. Be it a XLS sheet, be it a XML document and you get the structure as well, then, then that's, that's good. Must it be given in electronic form or can I print it out? Uh, and I have to double check, but I assume it would, would be required in electronic form. I think that if you make an electronic request, they have to give an electronic reply. Could be, yeah. If they send or just a mail? <coughs> then they may be able to give you a paper version. <laughs> <laughs> so they need to get my TIFF file on paper. Yeah. <laughs> We've printed this video for you. <laughs> My organization needs a DPO, a data protection officer. No. no. Yes. No. Yes. No. Dash. It depends. Depends on other things. When do you need a DPO? If you're public. Authority. Even the smallest public thing has to have a DPO, even if it's just two people. A little stupid, but it's in there. Um, second reason why you would need the DPO, if your core activities require regular and systematic processing at a large scale. The GDPR does not define exactly how those should be filled in. It does provide some guidance, um, but probably if you're in an organization and you do regular and systematic processing at a very large scale, you know who you are and you, you need a DPO. Even if you have a small <coughs> company, you have somebody who is uh, uh, processing all these data, even if it's not on a large scale, you need an officer who is responsible for the data processing. Yeah. I'm sorry, GDPR you don't? If you do not fall under these three categories, you do not need DPO. Most medium and even mid-sized organizations would probably not need a DPO. Why, why are, are then the regulations for uh, general practice and medicines so that they are personally uh, involved in organizing and having a um, a booklet where they where they uh, declare how to process all these data and they have to give it to the government. That's the third one, sensitive data, medical well yeah the, well, the, the, the it's medical not large. It's sensitive but it's not large. It's one of the three. Well yeah a large scale of sensitive data, but it's, it's for a doctor, it's, it's their only activity. And it's very peculiar because of it. It's, it's mostly medical data, so life saving data. Yeah. data. So it's, it's not even necessary to, to, uh, to use the uh, GDPR at all. Mm -hmm. yeah, so maybe it's a, a, a additional legislation yeah. for yeah. doctors. No. Could be. It isn't. Are you sure it's, that it's certainly not in GDPR that it is a requirement for every doctor to have DPO. Are you sure that sensitive data is only at large scale and not that uh, it's not needed if sensitive data is only appears well very unregularly? I'll I'll double check the wording, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Mm. But but still, even in the case of a doctor, I would argue that, that is already large scale. For obvious that, reasons, it's a subjective uh, term. Yeah, that, that indeed would, would be a, a discussion. Um, but I think it mentions large scale. So if it's a, it's a clinic, I would certainly argue it's yeah, large sure. scale. If it is one doctor that has right. lives in a small village and has yeah. 100 patients, I, I mean, yes, it's totally core activity. But to specifically apply, um, 
points DPO? I don't think it would be applied. Unless there's a specific rule in a certain country for doctors. Could be. Is there something like, like <coughs> otherwise when there's uh, regulations, you often have a separate document with um, the, the reasoning yeah. behind the laws. Oh, yeah. something like that for GDPR? Yeah, the, re the recitals. There are about 200 of them. Wow. <laughs> and there are only 99 articles in the, in the GDPR itself. So. Okay. I, know, I know in the US there exists uh, data for or specific rules for, for data with medical stuff, mm -hmm. but I'm not really sure that exists also here in Europe. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I haven't studied the regulations for, for medical uh, things, but there's nothing in the GDPR in my sense that would require it, except um, the, the large scale. So it would certainly apply to hospitals. Uh, but to a single family practitioner in a small village, I don't know. But I'll check the wording uh, of the, uh, the exact wording. And obviously, then there is the interpretation of when it is large scale. Yeah. And then th that's what we see a lot, I think, which with this, that interpretation can be completely different. Sure. Two companies doing the exa exact same thing yeah. and having a completely different result. Yeah. Yeah, however, I, I re honestly, I, I can't imagine I made that mistake of, of not copying the large scale if it wouldn't be explicitly in the text. Yeah. So, okay. you can argue what and then scale the, is, but yeah, small... Yeah, then the large scale, scale, what is large scale yeah. indeed? 100 patients, is that large scale, yes or no? In quantity, it's not a big one, but the, the data collected could be very large. Yeah. So then you get a discussion. Which one defines large? Yeah. The people are, who are registered or the amount of data that is registered for each person? Yeah, also. Yeah. But it's also something that, that, that flows throughout the entire GDPR uh, legislation. You have to, at certain points, you have to make assessments yourself. You have to think about the, the, the data you have, about how you process it, and especially about the risk that could occur when, when it leaves, when it gets out. So you have to do risk assessments yourself. And if you've done that assessment and you decide this is not large scale and you document that and the, the regulatory authorities come in and, and ask you, hey, that's large scale according to us and you show them the document. I'm sorry, this is the reason why I think it's not large scale. Then you've at least done your homework. They could disagree, but you've done your duty. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we mentioned sensitive data, health data. Um, there are some more. Um, those in Belgium who work for HR departments will be surprised to find trade union membership. Trade union membership is... Um, yeah, I'm according not to joke. I've got no idea what you mean by that. Vakbond. Uh, oh, Vakbond. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you're a member of a trade union, so a Vakbond, um, that's considered to be sensitive data according to GDPR. Uh, for us Belgians, that's quite strange because uh, trade unions have a lot of power in companies and a lot of companies keep a register of who's a member of a trade union because certain payments have to flow in a certain way whether they're a member of a trade union or not. Um, but the moment you touch trade union data uh, or, or the membership of, of uh, an a, um, employee, then that data becomes critical data. Uh, also, political, religious, and philosophical beliefs. Um, there's some discussion about how far you go in that. Uh, so, theoretically, it's a sensitive data. So, the second part of my implement of my discussion: GDPR for nerds. Um, how do you become certified? Get certified? Yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, no. No. Everybody wants to sell you GDPR certified <coughs> procedures, GDPR certified products, C C look, GDPR certified training. There's no such thing yet. Um, there is a provision in the GDPR to have some kind of certifications and a certification body that could um, certify certain procedures or certify certain things. None of them have yet been certified. Adhere to code of conduct, same thing. It is foreseen in the GDPR that those things will exist at a certain point in time, 
but at the moment nobody has a GDPR European Certified Code of Conduct. So every mail, every spam mail you get from a vendor that is trying to sell you a GDPR certified product or to trying to enlist you in a GDPR compliant code of conduct is pure marketing BS. There's no such thing yet. It will come in the future and I think it will be a good thing, but at the moment it doesn't exist and the consensus is that it won't exist for a few years because everybody wants to test the first cases of those discussions we just had, what is large scale, what is um, processing, etc. Et so uh, those will come, but they don't exist yet. They want to wait the lawsuit. Probably. Yeah. Well, a lawsuit can be good. I mean, a lawsuit, if there is a lawsuit about, about the interpretation of GDPR, you will have a judge making a judgment. So unless that judge has made a bad judgment, which is entirely possible, but if there are few judges that decide the same thing, then it's clear that the GDPR has to be interpreted in a certain way. So yes, I think they're waiting for a few lawsuits, um, the dust to, to clear up and um, start to get uh, people certified. Now, ISO 27000, it's not necessary. Are people trying to sell you ISO 27001 certification tracks because of GDPR, it is not a requirement. Nothing at all. However, it probably helps a lot. Because, especially ISO 27000, includes things such as risk assessments. And the goal would be that if you combine classical security-focused risk assessment of the 27000 ISO standard, and you add a, a privacy risk assessment to that, then you're, and you follow that track entirely, then you're probably on a really good way to, um, to be certain that you're doing everything according to the GDPR. So it helps, but it's not, a nece it's not necessary at all. Now, if you want my advice how to be compliant, there are five steps uh, I want to give you. First one, think, and most important one, think about the data your organization processes and map that data. How does the data flow into your organization? Where do you get your data from? What legal basis? One of those six things, consent, contract, etc., etc. What basis can you use to process that data? Who keeps it? Where is it stored? Do you keep it on your own service? Is it with third party? Um, do you know where that third party keeps the data? Um, is it encrypted? Is it in a paper binder in a cupboard? Is that cupboard locked or not? So start with doing that. That's the most important part of GDPR. And in fact, for small organizations, one of the only requirements um, is to, to document that study and to document the flow of the data and to keep it into a register. Um, and that, I promise you, there will be two slides, uh, three slides where I mention GDPR Buckler. That's exactly the thing that we do. We offer an online service to keep that data for small organizations. Now, if you don't know how to start that, um, look up, search for this on the internet, combination of GDPR. Why, who's, what, when, where? Five whys. Um, there's a good document written out by the privacy officer of the Isle of Man, of all places. <laughs> uh, they have about 2,000 inhabitants and a couple of sheep. Um, so he has a lot of spare time. And he wrote an excellent, <laughs> he wrote an excellent document about how to make such a register. And it starts by asking those five questions, mapping them, keeping them <coughs> in the register, and that's a really good basis to start such a register. So Google that if you're interested. Second step, once you know where your data is, uh, how it flows, where it comes from, and where you keep it, think about the security and privacy of the systems. Uh, first, from a technical point of view, how are my systems secured? What is encrypted? What is not encrypted? what needs to be encrypted, because not a misconception, GDPR does not tell you what to do. The GDPR tells you, you have to decide on the security of the data, and it has to be adequately, which means that um, some of these username and email address for a mailing list will probably need less encryption and less protection than some of these medical records. You have to think about the data, you have to make the, the, the assessment, and you have to design your security 
adequately for that data. Um, the GDPR offers a few guidelines, but they're not mandatory, regarding encryption, um, regarding access control. Um, I mean, everybody who's ever even looked at ISO 27,000 well, will remember, uh, will recognize most of them. GDPR does stress privacy by design. Um, in every new system you design, theoretically even every legacy system, unless you really can't change it, you they should be designed in such a way that privacy comes first. Which means that if you're building a web platform and it has um, different privacy settings in which the user can choose, you should have the, the default ones be the most private ones. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> another one that privacy by design means, and it's a thing I, I I was hoping I would never see again, but I still see it mm. every day. Your development database should not be a copy of your production database if it contains personal data. Why should a developer have access to real production sensitive, privacy sensitive data for everyone? They shouldn't. They, you should, the moment you, if you absolutely want to transfer your production uh, database to testing or, or development, you should apply a filter that filters out all the data, or scrambles it, or replaces it, or mangles it, or does whatever you want, but there should be no personal data in there. So that is privacy by design as well. Privacy by default, we've covered. Um, ISO 27000 could be a guideline. It's not mandatory at all, but if your organization is already ISO 27000 certified, or, or you're applying some of the principles, uh, it would be e really easy to use those to uh, comply with GDPR. You just need to add privacy uh, to, to that mix and you're set. Step three, be transparent and <coughs> honest. Um, it applies to the privacy policy. It should be transparent and honest. It should not be 50 pages of legalese that nobody understands except the lawyer who wrote it, maybe. Uh, it should be transparent to your users. It should be in a language that your users understand. Um, even further, if your if your company has a privacy policy on their website or for a certain procedure, and it is 50 pages of legalese that nobody reads, well, they're in violation of GDPR. Even if, technically speaking, everything that needs to be in the privacy policy is in there, the GDPR requires those policy to be readable. So think about that. Um, sorry for the lawyers, um, but legalese won't cover it this time. Uh, one of the other few mandatory things for small organizations is a log of data breaches. You need to keep a log of a data breach. Now a data breach can be something major. It could also be um, John from accounting who lost a USB stick. Or Emily's laptop who was stolen. Even if that laptop was completely encrypted, or you could remote wipe it, it's still a data breach and you should log it into a logbook, make a note of it, and if it's something you can do something about, then have a plan to prevent that from happening it again or minimize the impact if it happens again. So that's one of the other few mandatory things that are in the GDPR for small organizations. Do you also have to publish these breaches? No. Or? No. Okay, you have to keep them. them. You have to keep them centrally, so they have to be one logbook, not 10,000. Mm -hmm. And if ever um, there's a major data breach and the, the authorities want to have a look at it, you have to be able to show it to them. But only if they ask you, and only to them. Okay. So it's an internal document. It also applies when your company has a, a public uh, interest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that you have to publish it. No, they don't have to publish it. You never have to publish it. You never have to publish it. Um, another thing has an emergency plan in case of a breach. Sounds logic, but think about that in advance. What are we going to do as an organization if something happens? What are we going to do if Emily loses her encrypted laptop? What are we going to do if our entire uh, web application had been breached and somebody had published all the usernames and accounts on GitHub? What are we going to do? Have a plan. There's, okay. no, there's no details as to uh, which measures would be deemed uh, appropriate. It's 
up to you. Well, there are a few things. Um, in certain cases, you have to report the breach to the authorities within 27 hours of you becoming aware of that breach. That's uh, something to do. Sorry. Um, um, and and I mean, most of the times they work with you, and they will they will probably <coughs> tell you what to do or what not to do. There are a few exceptional cases where you have to inform your the, the affected persons as well. Um, but uh, but so know. there's no requirement. The plan uh, must include a measure to remedy the breach. Something like that. Nothing like that. No. They don't require you to have a, a, such a detail, I mean, to have those specifics are not entry. I think once it's on GitHub that you do need to inform the data subjects, for example. Yeah, well, it depends what got leaked. Yeah. If it's the subscribers to a mailing list about load days events, I would inform them, but if you don't inform them, I mean, what could happen? You know that you would may be interested in attending the day event. You could argue that be that becoming public knowledge might not be such a big deal because we're recording this and your question well your face would probably not be on camera, your question could be on the camera on the camera. So your voice could be somebody could tell me, Hey, that's part. And you just check that in Facebook that you are there. Probably. Maybe. So you have to make an assessment and have to look at the risks for the individuals data got leaked. Now, of course, once there are passwords involved, as we all know, people are sloppy and use the same password everywhere. So, uh, in that case, I would inform them. So, where were we? Um, yeah, have a plan in case of a breach and have a procedure to handle those requests uh, you'll get. I mean, there will be people, I know for sure, uh, and I'm one of them, that will ask certain companies on the 25th of May, please give me all the data you have, because I want to know. Yes. Um, <laughs> why? <laughs> why? <laughs> My telco has informed me that they have a service that watches um, my behavior on the internet and provides um, targeted TV ads. I want to know how exactly they do that. So I want to know how they measure that and what they do. Uh, so I'll ask Tillianet on the 25th of May, please tell me what you have about me. I'm sorry, Tillianet. But that's a planned denial of service attack on these companies, no? They're going yeah. to <laughs> 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 die in yeah, legal purpose, yes. Not only that, there are already <laughs> circulating <laughs> templates of uh, legal letters which go as far as possible. But, uh, aren't you expecting a whole pile of bullshit to be sent to Of course. You? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's still yeah, angry that the TV ads still aren't personalized. <laughs> yeah. No, um, and if you, as a company, if you see that a lot of those requests are bullshit, there are some ways in GDPR to counter them. You can tell a subject, I'm sorry, this is a bullshit request. Um, you're not getting it, or you could even, in certain cases, but you have to be really careful about that, you could ask a, an administrative fee to process that. Um, but I would advise, while the GDPR offers that as a possibility, I would advise against it because the backlash will be huge and it will certainly be uh, subject to investigation. Uh, but I mean, I have a procedure to, to, to do that. I know it's that. A, it's a cool idea, I'm going to play along. You can also start a group that from uh, governments, uh, uh, they have. Uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a mob, uh, uh, we've, got, we've got a law that if I send a request to the to the government, they have to supply everything. Yeah. That openbaarheid is due. Yeah. The, the government is obviously not being held accountable for it. Um, That's another way to cover this as a um, as a company is doing what Facebook did and just made a button available on their website that allows you to download all that stuff. So you could Sadly, it doesn't give you everything. Sorry? It doesn't give you so much stuff that they have on you. I don't know. It I downloaded my my zip file. It was 30 megs. It didn't contain anything about where I clicked, yeah. where I, what they have when I wasn't logged in from other websites. I, I don't know. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't downloaded the Facebook. Mine is 80 megs. It just does whatever I uploaded. Yeah. But in some cases, it gives you more than everything. 
because people have a sort of things that they didn't expect there because they deleted it. So well, yeah, so but, Tom uh, just said he had a huge data set, or did we misunderstand that? Tom, hmm? didn't you say that you had a bigger data set? Yeah, I, I, as far as I know, I, I, I skimmed through it, but there were things in there that I didn't expect. People that I called and phone calls and things like that. The, the, oh. the Facebook app collects a lot of data on your phone. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah. But you give permission to your phone book. Yeah. I'm not sure, sure, but I don't guess I did. <laughs> but was it free? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but shouldn't Facebook also return information that you did not provide, but that they keep of you yeah. from others? Yeah, but they don't do that at this time. Yeah, they don't do that. Yeah. 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 I don't know, I haven't looked at the Facebook data, but I know that a lot of companies are building those tools um, in their application just to be able to handle that. Yeah. And to be honest, if you would uh, design a new web application or some kind of application that gathers data, and you have to design it from scratch, I would seriously consider adding such a, such a feature, because it will help you with those requests. Please make sure that only that user can download this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to be very difficult if that needs to be possible without the user being identifiable. Because if uh, the grey-haired person in that type of shirt, uh, I don't know, comes to you and asks for that information, but you don't have his name, then you still have to give him the information of the grey-haired person with that type of shirt. No, to be, to be able to request that data, you have to identify yourself. So it can only be about identifiable information, and for example... Well, if, Facebook, about if Facebook knows that, that uh, grey-haired Slightly. At the dinner last night um, was Toshan, and Toshan requests this yeah. information, it should be in there. And probably now they claim they don't know it. But if Bart asked that information, what would he get back? How do you mean Bart? So, and <coughs> Hopefully the not point is that, or the point that Bart is trying to make is identifiable. That means I request for my data. Yeah. Now, if I request for another person's data... No, you can't. You shouldn't. Okay, so... But you shouldn't. Yeah, but you should, you how do they know who is identifiable? I mean, if they only have a picture of you, what, you need to send your picture to identify that you are the person in the picture? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Yeah. 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 What if you ask for data for your kids or deceased family? Uh, <laughs> deceased family is a strange topic in the GDPR, Google as GDPR does not stuff. apply to deceased people. <laughs> <laughs> Once you stop reading your data, you're, you're not, <laughs> it's free not personal data. <laughs> it's really strange. It's just just got another business case, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really strange, but um, information about, about somebody who has deceased does not fall in the GDPR regulation. So, kids? Kids are special. Um, for kids, uh, I don't know the specific details because it's complicated, but for kids there's certain, there are two things. There's one is um, who can give certain consent, um, and at a certain age the kids can give consent themselves for certain things. And the other things are, uh, for instance, I think for the, the requests for data, it has to be done by the parents, I think. I'm not sure. For kids it's complicated. And the extra complicated thing for kids is that GDPR allows the countries, one of the few things they did allow to change themselves, is the age at which you can give consent. It can be between, if I'm not mistaken, 13 and 16. Uh, and for instance, Belgium implemented a law that gives kids the right to consent to certain things at 13 years old, while France keeps it at 16. So if you're doing business all over Europe with kids, it gets complicated. Do you know how it works with handicapped people? So, so, so you are they, not legally... something like a legal guardian. That yeah, then I them. would assume that that legal guardian has to give consent. Yeah, has to, well, or the, the person itself has to give consent for the legal guardian. Uh, I, 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 I don't know that's the case, I'm sorry. It's one of the cases which will be coming uh, up in the next few years. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. I think that a 
if, it's if, if it has been legally decided that you are incapable of giving consent, you can't give consent. Okay. I, I would assume it works. Yeah, but if you were able to give consent, but not quite sure that you don't no have what you're doing, yeah. 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 But then I think it's gray area. area. Yeah. Mm. So. Slightly gray area. Yeah. Slightly <laughs> <laughs> gray. Slightly gray area. Right. Um, where were we? We were on step four uh, in our compliance plan. Um, you have to map third parties that have, might have access or might process data that belongs to you. And you need the special contract, and I'll bring that up in the next slide. And once you've covered that, you're done. And there's a nice number fifth. You open your favorite drawing program. You design yourself a very nice GDPR certified logo. You frame it in your office, you show it to your boss and you the amount of data. So, processes. Um, first in definition, controller is the owner, so to speak, of the data. If you control the data, then you're the controller. The processor is a third party that processes data that isn't owned by them. So they process data for a processor, uh, for a controller, I'm sorry. Now the processor can have sub-processors uh, and on and on and on. So then GDPR defines that there needs to be a legal contract of some sort between the controller, so the one owning the data, and the processor, the one processing the data. Um, that contract can take any form, um, but there are certain items that are required to be in that contract. Most often you'll see that those, those terms get integrated in general terms and conditions or a general contract. Um, most of the time that, that's a possibility. An important thing to note is that it's a shared liability. Such a contract cannot state that the liability for the privacy shifts completely one way or the other. GDPR explicitly defines that such clauses are illegal and that both are have a shared responsibility. That does not mean that if you as a processor do everything according to the book and are completely in order and the controller is making a mess and is doing things that are clearly not compliant, that you'll be held accountable. But for instance, GDPR states that if you do notice such a thing, you have to inform them. You don't have to inform the authorities, but you have to be able to prove that you have informed the controller, or the other way around the processor, dear party, um, I've noticed you doing this and that and that. I don't think that's in um, compliance with the GDPR. And then if they still keep doing that, that's their problem, you've done your homework, um, but you can prove that you've informed them. So, um, a processor can use sub-processors, but must name them, which is a bit strange. Imagine I have a platform that does uh, online, a s online CRM tool, for instance, and I keep my your customer of mine, um, so you input your CRM data into my platform, so you're the controller, because it's your data, I'm the processor, I'm the processor, I process your data, and I take my backups in cloud. Now, in those backups, it's your data. So, the backup provider I'm using is a sub-processor. Now, imagine that today I'm using Amazon as three buckets to take my backups. And all of a sudden, I don't want to use Amazon anymore, and I switch to DigitalOcean. Their, their storage solution, and I dump my backups over there. Theoretically, I have to inform you, dear customer, I'm switching my backup provider from Amazon to DigitalOcean. Even more, you could object. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I want to keep my data in Europe and not in the US <coughs> for some reason. Uh, yeah. But it's a bit strange. That you could object to where I keep my backups. Yeah. Or you could object to um, another sub processor that I'm using. So that's a bit vague in the GDPR, and I think a lot of lawsuits will arise from that. Okay. Is, is it vague? But it's not vague, but it's because you're saying I can object. Yeah, but yeah. That sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, yeah you can it. object, but GPR does not state what happens when you object. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I object. Good for you. Yeah, and the problem <laughs> really would lead to a lot of discussion and legal legal issues and stuff. Like yeah, that. yeah. And I mean, people have. Uh, I think uh, LinkedIn process uh, shows a list of all the sub processors. There's 80 people on them. 80 companies. 
So those get changed all of the time. Um, if they have to ask consent from everybody for changing the mind, that's not the only solution. Uh, I have five more minutes, so I'll be skipping um, a few of the uh, next slides. Um, you don't need to... Well, I just showed the five minutes so that you know that you should yeah, yeah. continue. Yeah. <laughs> it's not it's five minutes exact. You can yeah. take a little bit longer. But yeah, it doesn't mind going yeah. a little bit more. You can into transfer GDPR. my talk into a lightning one. We'll do an uh, we'll 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 open space discussion at yeah. five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I do want to um, show this one because it's important. Um, what is processing? I've seen people come to me telling me, Frank, I am a um, marketing consultant, and for a customer, I have read-only access to their Google Analytics account, and I don't touch anything, I don't change anything, I look at the data, and I tell them to change certain things on their website. Am I a processor? Yes, you are. Of course you are. You're processing the data, but I'm not processing it, I'm not changing anything, etc., etc. does not matter, because the GDPR says that consultation of data is processing. So you're very often a processor without knowing that. If you have access to that data, and if you're doing anything with it, even just reading, even just looking at statistical aggregated numbers of that data, you're processing the data. So beware of that. But, but if you're looking at the statistics, then, it, is it, then it's not private data anymore. You cannot... It depends on the statistics. It depends on the statistics. There's a family in my street that has six kids. There's only one of those. So if a family in that street turns up as a general statistic, it can only be them. But that is identifiable, right? Yeah. So if you're sure it's more of an identifiable data, then... Yeah, but it's more often identifiable than you think. Also, people come to me, the data is pseudonymized. Or the, the, it's just an identifier and not a name. I'm sorry, that's still identifiable. Because at another party, there's a list of mapping those numbers to real usernames. As long as that list exists, it's not anonymous data, which means it's still identifiable. So only if you're completely sure that it's completely anonymous, then it stops being personal data. So, uh, yeah, those I've covered. Having access to a customer VPN router. Yes, you're a processor, because you can access the data that travels on that VPN, which might include personal data, so keep that in mind. Which is pain in the ass for a lot of companies. Yeah. And last one, especially at this point in time, my advice, if in doubt, consider processing. Consider yourself to be a processor if you think you are. But the, the, the one thing, especially since you men mentioned storage in the next one, um, well, the uh, regulation you mentioned is that if, if, I, if, if my service runs on a uh, dedicated server I rent for, from, say, Hetzner, is Hetzner a uh, uh, sub-processor? Do they have access to the data? I mean, if they, they, switch it, if they, if they pull the disks from, yeah. from the server, then they, they, they do. That's or if you have a disk replaced because it's defective. Yeah. Uh, which happens. Yeah. Very well. Which happens. Yeah. Very well. <laughs> yeah. Depending on the contract. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the gray areas. At this point in time, I'm inclined to say yes, they are. Um, but I think that along the way, um, we'll, we'll see what how the judges think and how the, the, the authorities think. I can only use service in the EU. I think, I hope everybody knows by now, the answer is no, but it helps. Um, because GDPR states that you can not use uh, processors or sub-processors that are not in the European economic area, which is basically the EU plus three other countries, unless, unless that processor appears on a list of countries often offering equal protection. Now that list is pretty short, they're about I think five or six countries on them. Um, the US is on there, but only for uh, very specific information services, so not physical goods, uh, and only if that other company applies to the privacy shield uh, regulation uh, in place. And but there are lawsuits uh, with Facebook on yeah. knowing uh, that privacy shield is going to fall. I would 
I think so as well, but as it is today, that's no regulation. I think as well the privacy shield will fall again, um, and, and then we're in a different situation. But today, you can still do that. Uh, Canada, beware as well, it's only certain parts of Canada that are allowed. Uh, yeah, certain parts. It's funny. Like, like, like French-speaking ones, so... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know exactly which one, but indeed, there's a... a certain parts have different laws than other parts regarding privacy, and only those are approved. Now, what do you do if, those co if, if you want to transfer data to a country that's not on the list? There are two ways. Um, the second one, the, the last one, binding corporate rules only apply if you're part of a very large international international organization that has branches all over the place, um, then there's a way to have agreements between all those uh, all those companies in the same group. And the second to last one, standard clauses, is basically a model contract that the EU has drafted and then you have to enforce that contract with your process. Uh, some will be happy to sign that, others won't. So we work that. Ha! Ah, trick question! <laughs> the present! <laughs> no? Yes? The real answer is nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it has been extended until 2020. For certain things, but it's not clear if GDPR applies to that as well. And it's not about the EU, but everybody is agreeing with something earlier. That's the best answer. Uh, currently not. They All might right. They might become a member of the, of the uh, European area. But that's not certain, certain as well. If they do, then it's easy. If they don't, then nobody knows. <laughs> so beware uh, but if you choose a new processor before the Brexit. I'm sorry for the Brits, but... This I is going to cost them so much money. Every data breach needs to be reported. I think we've covered that one as well. No. A data breach will, re will result in a fine. No. No. The opposite is true. If you don't report it, you'll get fined. Right. Um, so don't be afraid. To be transparent. Be honest. And if you do have a breach uh, and you think the impact is big, then do inform the authorities. Uh, it's better to inform them too much than, than too little. <laughs> well, that turns into a deal or stupid. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and is there already a way to inform them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone has their own way. Uh, the, the Netherlands has a very, very good system. The Belgium system is a bit strange. <laughs> because you need, it involves signed PDFs and you need a real acrobat reader, etc. Et Which authorities does one inform? The Department of Motor Vehicles? <laughs> <laughs> good question. Uh, every country has assigned a privacy authority. Um, in Belgium, it's the former privacy commissie. commissie. Uh, I think in Germany it must be the Bundes, I don't know what's the shop. I No, the, the, the one you're in. So um, you go to a national one. Uh, data breaches. <coughs> tell it all, tell it fast, tell the truth. Um, if you have a breach, <coughs> you have to report to the authority. Don't hide anything. Tell them what you know. Be honest, be transparent. Um, that's the, the easiest way. Is there any possible reason for a company to not do that because the possible, I don't know, like they get sued something like that for a data breach? No, they'll get sued if they don't. For this uh, legislative basis, yes, but is there also a, a counter reason not to publish it? Like, like getting sued for, it's I don't know. Well, the, the fines you could get, yeah, we, yeah, which is, yeah. the fines you could get for not reporting, and if it's really a really serious issue, are 4% of your global company turnover. So that could be higher than any... So that could be extremely mm -hmm. high. Now, those are of course the maximum numbers and if you have a small minor misconformance, <coughs> you, you probably won't get a fine at all. And if you do get a fine, it will be a small one. Um, but that's the maximum number. And they're there for a reason. Um, they, for instance, we look, when, when you look at the, uh, uh, what's it called, Equifax data breach a couple of months ago in the States, they had known for months before coming out in public. If that would have happened in Europe and GDPR, I'm sure they would be fine. Not for having that data breach, not for having a security officer that probably not the right people, 
um, but for not telling them for months. You should, if you have a breach and it needs to be reported, you should report it within 72 hours. Of no, I, I don't think this is this is like publishing it either. It's like telling no, the no, government not, that yeah, this no, happened. Yeah. It's yeah. not like to you publish it. Actually, it's, it's it's likely that by just putting it in a register, it won't ever get to see the light of the press. Right. Yeah, well, there are two things. One is the register. The second one is reporting. Ah, okay. So you have to put every breach yeah, right, in that right, record, right. and the, the the important ones you have to report them. Is the register public or no. especially not public? It's not public. Yeah. It's confidential to report. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's confidential, but they can force you to inform if it's a big data breach. They can uh, force you to tell the public or tell the affected people. And it's of course only confidential until that department is breached. Yeah. Yeah. Which <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Ik denk dat ze dan Adobe verplicht, dus ik kan dat niet lang doen. Ja, ze moeten. Zo, vijf punten om te nemen. GDPR is real, je organisatie is probably affected. Alle GDPR certificaties vandaag, die existen, zijn puur marketing bullshit. Don't fall for them. Um, be transparent, think about data, think about security, uh, think about those uh, control processor agreements, make sure they're in order and, and you have them when needed. Um, work in a large organization, do have a plan that's written out uh, for a data breach and a access request but you, because you will get them. Um, as transparency is such an important thing, having a good plan and knowing what to do um, really helps that. So, thanks. Um, I was hoping to have time for questions and answers, um, but I'm already running five minutes into uh, the next person's talk. Um, I'll, I'll put, on, put up the slides and, and a few posters uh, to that to that document prepared by the gentleman in the Isle of Man. Uh, I'll put that online. Uh, it's not there yet, but I'll, I'll get it that by tomorrow. So, thank you.